Hi there. Good evening, all of you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, if you can, just put on in the chat that you can in case there is any problem with my audio. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, before we start, just wanted to tell you that um, we now have, as on date, 19 MCC graduates that Kocharya has produced. Uh, in the last batch, we had of about you know 13 or 14 people, pretty much almost all who had applied have got their credentials. Um, and by the time I think I see a post through all those who had applied, probably we would have over 20. Uh, and if we manage to reach 23, which we might, we would probably on, be on par with Japan. And if you overtake Japan, we would be the fourth largest producer of MCCs as a training company, just behind the countries of United States, Canada, and UK. And uh, that was a vision that we had some years ago when there was a criticism that Kocharya was a factory that was producing coaches. And uh, it would be rather difficult to produce master coaches from a factory. They have to be sculpted. <laughs> I think that is what I think we are proving at this point in time. Um, so our next batch uh, of <sighs> mentoring and training master coaches would start sometime in mid-January. We probably would have, would take about 15 odd people in this batch and we have probably about eight or nine who have already sort of indicated uh, they desire to join. So those of you who may perhaps wish to join this program, do let us know as soon as you can. Um, the other uh, information is most of you would have received the information and many of you have in fact uh, registered for the conference on the 19th of uh, December. Uh, the purpose of this conference is to go just a bit beyond uh, just a gathering of coaches um, and talking about mentoring of competencies. We want to get into the larger space of leadership. So we are hoping at least about half the audience and we expect an audience of about 350 to 400 would comprise leadership development managers and HR. And therefore this would be an opportunity for many of you as coaches to interact with people who are from the industry and corporations. And we've also sent out mailers to many of you requesting you to uh, pass on those mailers, forward them to friends of yours uh, who are corporate executives, who are at this point in time not coaches, who may be willing to and wishing to uh, uh, sort of join us purely from a point of view, understanding how coaching can help. The topic is lead for change. And it's, uh, we have a number of speakers who are mostly from the corporate space who are going to talk about their experiences. And we have what is called a large scale interactive process, um, which, which is not that often seen in conferences, rather difficult to arrange. Uh, we are trying to do that to be able to put together the viewpoints of almost all the 300 to 400 participants uh, in terms of leadership challenges that are being faced in India. So I really look forward to seeing as many of you as possible um, in this conference. So coming back to today, um, we had covered in this in the last about, I think, four or five sessions, uh, various aspects of what I would like to call a spirituality and coaching, which goes beyond um, just an ordinary coach-client relationship into something deeper in terms of awareness, deeper in terms of what is called transpersonal coaching. Um, last week, we had a pretty exciting discussion, I thought, on various aspects of when we started on use of self and uh, issues of awareness and so on. So I would really like to um, 
uh, have questions, any of you who would like to uh, sort of discuss more on what was discussed last week, I can put you onto the panel and we can start discussing that. Uh, I would like to spend a few minutes on that because the whole purpose of this webinar is interactive participation, not just merely my holding forth uh, here. Uh, it doesn't make much sense if I'm the only person talking. Uh, Yatin, I don't know if, yeah, currently I can do anything about your audio. As far as I can hear from other people, my audio is good. Um, so you check yours. Uh, what I would like to, after, if, uh, uh, if there are any questions and I answer those questions, I would like to go deeper into uh, the four states of awareness as uh, the Eastern scriptures uh, sort of uh, look at the whole aspect of awareness and consciousness. Uh, so, uh, so at this point in time, before we go deeper into the subject, uh, where I would really like to talk about uh, why we in Kocharya differentiate between mind fullness and mindlessness. So what does that mean? What does the mindfulness mean? What does mindlessness mean in our lexicon? Uh, those kind of stuff. And why we believe that in coaching, mindlessness, mindless awareness is really what is key to uh, masterful coaching. Um, so yeah, are, are there any questions? Or is there anybody who would like to come on to the panel? Um, and ask questions or say something about whatever their reflections on the last session or last few sessions is. If you have this, uh, you, you can always, uh, there's some device there where you can raise your hand or you can send me on the chat. Can you do a brief recap of the last session? I don't, I can't because I don't even remember what I talked about last time. Uh, so I think the whole purpose of here uh, is being the here and now, uh, to be honest. I haven't um, listened again to the uh, audio. So if you, any of you remember what it is about, you can ask me questions. Um, but I, I don't really, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to make any kind of a meaningful summarization of uh, what we talked about last time. How would you define consciousness as such? How different is it from my own memories? Apologies for the repeat question. There's a lot of talk about shift in consciousness and next big transformation. What would you say? Okay, let us start with that. I mean, you know, uh, there was, um, if I'm not making a mistake, it is uh, Dr. David Hawkins who wrote the trilogy of books called Power versus Force and then The Eye of the Eye and I. Um, he was one of, he, he, he was a psychiatrist and he was also a, a great thought leader. Uh, he introduced this concept of kinesiology at one point in time. And beyond that, he also established a metric where he talked about measurement of what he called consciousness over the ages. And this was on a logarithmic scale, if I remember right, going up to a thousand point. And he said somewhere around 200, and, and I, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, somewhere around 200, uh, we move into a state of consciousness which he believed ought to be human. And according to his calculation, it was only in the year 1970 that humankind actually breached that point of 200. So in that sense, in his evaluation, humankind was subhuman till 1970. Um, he sort of related it willy-nilly with uh, the new age movement that started in 1970, the age of the Beatles, if you wish, the hippies and so on and so forth. And he called it the age of consciousness. Now, what does it mean? It's up to each one of us to decide. Uh, decide. You can also refer to 
uh, concepts of spiral dynamics, Graves model, Beck. Many of these people have talked about, there's one of them, I don't remember who it is, spiral dynamics, Beck. Uh, they talk about the different colors where we move from blue to green and from red to blue and so on and so forth, which is about our worldview. One way of looking at consciousness is where you start moving from the selfish, egocentric I into a larger people-centric we. Uh, I'm just willingly picking up pieces uh, to put together. Uh, if you look at Carl Rogers' definition of coaching, when he talks about client congruence, unconditional positive regard and empathy and so on, I think that's a state of consciousness which moves beyond the egocentric consciousness. If you read Otto Shama on generative listening, where he talks about moving away from the kind of listening where we are trying to prove what we know or just satisfy our curiosity into something which is more, especially looking at what the potential of other people is. That is a shift in consciousness. And if you are familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, in the chapter, I don't remember the exact number, probably 15 or 16, uh, Krishna talks about the difference between the demons and the divine. And at the end of about 45 verses, he tells Arjuna, the real difference between a demon and a divine is that the demon thinks about only I, 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 and the divine thinks about just the we. So if you want to look at consciousness in one sense, it is about when we move from the I to the we. It is moving from or moving to the fifth level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs into the self-actualization. Uh, so each, each of us can define it in a different way. And, and that is really where, in a sense, that relates to awareness. And I'll come to that in a minute. How does this link to the awakening of chakras? Uh, at one level, the first three chakras which are the Muladhara, Swadishthana, and Manipuraka, or what are popularly known as in English, the root chakra. And by the way, it's not chakra, it is chakra. Uh, in Sanskrit means a wheel, a wheel of energy, um, which uh, those who were able to see beyond the mind and body saw this energy at seven different points in the human body. Uh, moving from the perineum point, the bottom of the spine, to the top of the head, the crown of uh, the head. And these seven chakras, they believed, were the points through which the energy rose. And ultimately, when the final union of mind, body, and spirit took place, it happened at the crown of the head. And at the root chakra, which is the bottommost point, we basically are rooted in desire, and that desire produces uh, as its counter guilt, shame, and many of the highly negative feelings. At the next point of the Swadishtana, it's a root of fear, all the primal fears that we have about death, perhaps about public speaking, anything about loss of ego and so on. And the third, the Manipuraka, the navel chakra, is about stress, it's about uh, getting things for ourselves. It, it, it's a combination of the guilt and the uh, desire that is producing guilt in us. And these three keep us down at the, the ego level. They are, they are ones which are very internally focused. And as long as we remain within these three, we are probably below the 200 mark that David Hawkins talked about. We get into a state of Equanimity, as it were, at the heart chakra level, where probably the first stirrings of consciousness arise, where we start relating with creatures, beings, people, 
outside of ourselves. We start looking from the we perspective, I perspective into the we perspective. And the three chakras which are above, the heart chakra, the throat, the third eye at the forehead and the crown chakra are those which can truly lead us into much higher levels of consciousness. Uh, each one has a different uh, meaning and perspective. But it's a shift actually from the sixth chakra, which is the third eye to the crown chakra, which signifies our ability to move totally from the realm of the mind and the body into one, which is beyond the mind and body into energy, the sahasrara. The word sahasrara means the thousand petal lotus, and it is believed that when we are at that level, when we experience that energy, the feeling of bliss that we experience is equivalent to that of almost as if it's a blossoming of a thousand petal lotus. So there are many ways of looking at this. Um, and uh, I mean, there's not directly related, but Ramchir and I, we have been talking about holding this retreat and Tiruvannamalai in mid-February, and uh, one of the main features of that would be to take the participants through a journey of the chakras, uh, primarily for the purpose of cleansing <clears throat> past memories, traumas, and so on, and to be able to create a space in which one can create a new vision, embed that, and move towards that as a reality. Uh, so in a sense, <clears throat> the awakening of the chakra is related to the awakening of the consciousness or the level of consciousness uh, in a very, very simplistic way that as long as we are focused on the lower three chakras, <clears throat> we are probably uh, at a low level of consciousness, somewhere around at the heart level, um, we probably start moving towards others. And beyond that, we start moving up in consciousness. What about the feminine energy at the Muladhara vis-a-vis -vis the lower consciousness? It's a union of Shiva and Shakti within. Not really, as far as I know, and there may be other explanations. Yes, the Muladhara is supposed to be the seat of the Kundalini, which is the three and a half coil serpent power that resides within. But at that point in time, the female energy or the Shakti energy, the Kundalini energy that resides within, is generally uh, in a somewhat an unconscious dominant state. So the whole process of, in Tantric process, to work with the Chakras is to move the Kundalini energy in a controlled way through the Shushumna Nadi, as it is called, through the various Chakras into the Sahasrara, which is where it's a union of the Shiva and the Shakti, or the mind-body with the energy, whatever metaphor that you want to use. And uh, the real union takes place at that point. And when we talk about the four states of awareness, the final state of awareness, which is beyond the mind and body into the energy, is really at that point. Um, so if, if there are any further questions on this, I, I, I don't want to make it into too esoteric kind of conversation about uh, these metaphoric significances. Um, but coming back to this, the, the connection here for me is um, if you look at the concept of mindfulness, for example, I, I, was, very, I was surprised at, uh, in one sense, and I was also deeply troubled in another way. Um, when I wanted to talk about the etymology of uh, mindfulness, and I was looking for references to the Buddhist scriptures. Um, the word mindfulness was a translation, in my mind, a very incorrect translation by an Englishman about 100 years ago of the Pali word that Buddha used called sati. The word sati in Pali meant memory. And it was the equivalent of the Sanskrit word called Smriti, which also means memory. Um, the original Buddhas, the eight paths, as they are called, the noble truths, the pathways, uh, included something which used to be referred to as right memory. 
And if you Google today, pretty much all that appears in the top 10 list of the Google uh, find, the right memory is being translated into right mindfulness, which to me is pretty obscene and abhorrent because that is, that is not true. Mindfulness has a totally different connotation. And when Buddha talked about memory, he didn't talk about it in a very uh, positive way. Nor do the scriptures, Eastern scriptures, talk about memory in a positive way. Nor do people like Jung and Freud talk about memory in a positive way. If many of you who would have probably during your coaching journey gone through the iceberg model, the unconscious in the Freudian and even the Jungian sense is about a lot of the negative memories that we hold. And that's the reason why they become unconscious. We try to repress them. The lower we go, the worse they become. Uh, many people may not like to talk about it, but if they are honest with themselves, they will say that when they first started their meditative practices, pretty much all thought that would come up are about sex and violence and guilt and shame. If you haven't really gone through that process, you haven't really meditated. You are cheating yourself, to be honest. Because the whole process of meditation is about allowing those negativities to come up and be in a way seen, relived and relieved. And it's only then that you can move up in your levels of consciousness. So mindfulness originally referred, the word mindfulness is derived from a Pali word and a Sanskrit word, which is about memories. And memories have a negative connotation those of you who are familiar with the scriptures, Sanskrit scriptures, you would know that there are two words called Shruti and Smriti. Shruti, which is that which is heard, is supposed to be the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutras, and so on and so forth. Those almost like it's a word of God. Whereas the Smriti is a word of man. It was something which was created by man. And it is based on what people experience, what their memories are, and therefore it's highly fallible as opposed to the Shruti, which is supposedly infallible. So now, unfortunately, that word of Buddha, which is about right memory, has been corrupted in some way today into something called mindfulness. And, and I would, I, I would like to have any of you share your experiences. Uh, my experiences with uh, mindfulness, where I deliberately went to some programs which talked about mindfulness, was primarily about, I mean, it started the 101, as it were, of mindfulness started with putting a raisin in your mouth. Um, first, you hold the raisin in your hand and you look at it and you feel it and you put it in your mouth, you taste it, you do whatever you want. And um, so when the person who was facilitating that program wanted to know from each of us uh, what was happening, um, and I said, yeah, I could pro probably sense all, except that I didn't hear the reason speak. And she was very upset. I thought I was, I was making a joke because she talked about looking at the raisin, she talked about touching the raisin, she talked about smelling the raisin and tasting the raisin. The only thing that the raisin didn't do was to speak. Now, if mindfulness is about sensory perceptions, it is related to the vagaries of the mind. And as long as it's related to the vagaries of the mind, or what yoga calls the movements of the mind, the second verse of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra says that yoga is about the cessation of the movement of the mind. Chitta vritti nirodaha is what the verse says. How to stop the movements of the mind? Why should you stop the movements of the mind? Because as Vivekananda says, the mind is a monkey. 
He says, it's like a monkey which is drunk and which is stung by a scorpion. And we are in the same stage. None of us can control the mind. The mind controls us. And the way the mind controls us is through the senses. The senses are the gateways which provide information to the mind. And then the mind in turn makes us do what those sensory perceptions move us to do. So the whole purpose of any spiritual practice is about moving away from the mind to be able to hold the senses within a certain amount of control. And that is what yoga is about. The word yoga, simply translated as union, it's about the union of the mind and the body transcending into energy, where there is a disconnect between the effects of the senses upon us, the effects of the senses upon us to be able to control us the way the senses are. For example, we react to something that is happening outside, stressed out with anger, lust, greed, fear, or whatever. But the whole purpose, if we are into any path of yoga or something similar, would be that whatever we perceive outside is not in a position to affect us. It is not possible for those experiences to create those negative emotions within us. We can be disengaged. We can look at it purely with compassion. If somebody is behaving to us in a manner which we believe is not appropriate, rather than getting angry, frustrated, irritated, and so on, we could become like the Dalai Lama. Look at it compassionately. And very often, uh, despite all my training and so on, to be able to disengage from stuff, and I'm not able to, the figure that I usually bring up to my mind is the Dalai Lama, is to be able to see things. What would the Dalai Lama do? Or what would a Ramana Maharshi do? And this is what enables us to move up in consciousness. And so when we are mindful, by definition, and also if we are going by the definition of what mindfulness is, it is about exercising awareness of our senses. And the more we exercise our awareness of senses, the deeper we go into the control of the senses, the control of the mind. So when the mind is full, we are actually acting through our ego. We are acting through some of our lowest impulses. Contrary to what exponents of mindfulness would say, that is what would really happen if you are truly mindful. We don't understand the meaning of mindful. They talk about mindful meditation. There is no such thing as mindful meditation. The mindful meditation is a very basic level of awareness, awareness where you started looking at things rather than completely be ignorant about them. It's a state which is, for example, if you were to talk about a couch potato sitting in a couch, uh, munching on fries and looking at TV and football, and oblivious of what you're doing, that of course is a total state of unawareness. So if you start paying attention to what you are doing, that's the first state of awareness that could possibly be called mindfulness, but it's still a very, very low state of awareness. So in the four states of awareness that the Mandukya Upanishad talks about, I would call it at the first level of awareness, where we are awake, where we are aware of our identity, we can think, we are controlled by our ego, we are controlled by our mind. And yes, if that is a state of awareness that we are happy about, we are at a very, very basic level of awareness. And we move through two other states of awareness, which are called in Sanskrit as the Satna and the Shushupti 
the dream state and the deep sleep state. And finally, we come into the fourth state of awareness, which is called the no mind state or the fourth state or what I prefer to call the mindless states. Just to make a difference, just to make people think it's, it's a joke, but it's not. The mindlessness is probably the highest level of awareness that you can reach. Okay, so let me take some questions. Mind here that we refer is memories. Yes, it's one of them. In Eastern scriptures, especially yoga, the mind has four parts. One of them is memory. Uh, there's another which is the higher intelligence, which is called buddhi. There's one which is the ego, which is called the hankara. And uh, what is it? There is one more. I, 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 for the moment, I, I forget what is the fourth. There are four parts of the mind, uh, the senses, sorry, senses, um, which operate. So you have manas, which is about the sensory perceptions. You have chitta, which is about me uh, memories. You have um, uh, ahankara, which is about the ego. You have buddhi, which is about the higher intelligence. And believe you me, this was talked about some five to 10,000 years ago. And today, neurobiologically, the triune theory of maximum and so on is exactly about that. The hypothalamus is the seat of our emotions and senses, which is a manas. The hippocampus is a seat of our memories, which is a chitti. The ego or the hankara is the lower seat, at the, the, the back, the top of the spine, which the instinctual memories are stored, and the buddhi is a prefrontal cortex, uh, which is where the higher intelligence resides. So these were talked about as the four states of the mind. Um, Jackie's question, my understanding of mindfulness is different than what you described, my understanding that being conscious, aware of what is present. Yeah, absolutely. That is how it is being marketed. Uh, that's fine. But basically, mindfulness is a state of awareness of the senses. It's of the sensory perceptions. And yes, there is an implication that is about the here and now. But the whole point is that as long as what we experience is that through the senses, we are being still controlled by the senses and being controlled by the mind. And higher levels of awareness is where we are able to move out of the senses and we are able to disengage from that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an experiential process. Uh, let, let me go back a bit. Uh, I don't know how many of you here have, what about intuition? Um, intuition has nothing to do with the senses. Intuition is when you are moving away from the senses. Uh, it, it's about the ability to, uh, in a sense, be able to be aware of something that is likely to happen in the future, uh, uh, not in the present moment. And if you're able to divine what's going to happen in the future in your present moment, that would be what is called intuition. And that very often happens if we are able to uh, move to the fourth state of awareness where the past, the present, and the future, to some extent, are visible to you. Uh, yeah, for me, mindfulness includes picking up intuition. Fair enough. I mean, that's each one has their own definition. I don't want to uh, sort of question that. That is how uh, many people say, what's your problem? Why are you talking about mindfulness as something which is negative? I'm not saying mindfulness is negative. I'm, all I'm saying is mindfulness is a very, very basic state of awareness. It's just a state of if, if you're able to hear me at this point in time, you're being mindful. If you're listening to me uh, and you are able to understand what words I'm using, you are being mindful. And if you're able to uh, sort of feel the temperature around you, it's hot or cold, you are being mindful. Uh, let me digress from that for a moment. If any of you have been through processes like Vipassana, which is a 10-day meditation program. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been, and you can put out on the chat, chat, box, chat, chat box and 
um, we, can, we can have a discussion about that. And if, if, if you haven't, I would strongly recommend that uh, you try and do that. And then you will understand what the difference between uh, mindfulness and mindlessness is. In a program like Vipassana, which is technically a Buddhist process, it was supposed to be the last uh, teaching of the Buddha to his disciples before he attained Nirvana. And it's also pretty much based on the Mandukya Upanishad and the Yoga Nidra process, which is available in Yoga and Tantra. It's, for a, it's a 10 day program. In 10 days, during the 10 days, you are not allowed to speak with another person. You are not allowed to look at another person in the eye. You are not allowed to read. You are not allowed to do anything except meditate. And even when you walk, you are supposed to keep your eyes down on the ground and not look at anybody else. You start around 4.30 in the morning, have your first meal at about 8, 8.30, and have the last meal of the day at about 12 o'clock, and the rest of the time from 4.30 in the morning till about 7, 7.30 in the evening, you sit down by yourself without contact with anybody else and you just meditate. Uh, many people run away from it. But if you're able to go through those 10 days, it's a life-changing experience, which is something that would truly define for you the awakening of the consciousness. In the first three days of Vipassana, all that you do is to watch your breath. What they tell you to do is to focus on that portion of your face just below the nostrils, above the lips, the space, the bridge as it were, the breath falling there, how does it fall, where does it fall, what temperature does it fall with, what speed does it fall, what are the experiences that you're having. That's all that you do, believe you me. And as you do this, obviously your mind is not resting, sleeping though you are supposed to be meditating on your breath, all thoughts of, all kinds of thoughts come out. Some of the worst thoughts that you can imagine. And you go through all that for three, three and a half days. On the fourth day, they take you to the next level of the process, which is called the Kriyas, which is you start moving from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, looking at each part of your body, point by point, space by space, and then suddenly they introduce this on the fourth day that for one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening, in whatever position you are sitting, you lock yourself in that position and you cannot move. And if you are truly authentic about wanting to practice Vipassana, what you will experience is sheer torture the most excruciating pain that you would have ever experienced in your life, you would be experiencing it during that time. For the first 15 minutes, everything is fine. The next 15 minutes, you start experiencing some kind of pain. The next half an hour is, believe you me, sheer agony. And this continues. I can only talk about the experience that I had. The fourth, the fifth, and the sixth day when I was doing this, it, it was so bad. And what usually happens is they ring a bell before you start the hour, and another bell is rung at the end of it. So you're just hoping that the bell would ring. And I wanted to be really very serious about what I was doing. And so I was putting myself through this penance and the torture, as it were. Somehow, on the end of the sixth day, I said, Look, I'm fed up. And I tried various other postures. You, you're not, technically, you're not allowed to sit in a chair unless you are disabled and you have some problems. But you, can, you cannot rest your back on a wall. Uh, but you can sit in any other kind of position. You can keep your knees in one position, your feet spread out, whatever you want. But whatever position that you keep is what you have to keep for that one hour. So you can try anything that you want. It wouldn't help you. So on the seventh day, I said to myself that this is 
I, I, I'm not going to be able to do that anymore. So I considered myself disabled as it were. I said, I'm going to sit in a chair. And I, so I put my stuff on a chair and there was a breakfast break. And when I came back, uh, on that particular day, they had brought in a whole lot of previous course participants and they had come in there. And so except the chair where I had put my stuff on, the other chairs were occupied. And there was one guy who actually had a problem. He was disabled. He had a limp and he could not sit on the floor because his knees were stiff and stuff like that. And then he couldn't find a chair and then he was wandering around trying to see where he could sit. And looking at him, I found that there was no way that I was going to be able to sit in a chair while he was going to be in pain sitting down on the floor. So I got up and offered him a chair and I said, oh my God, I'm going to suffer again. But believe you me, after I sat down, the bell rang, I woke up as it were. And I was not sleeping, I was in meditation, only when the bell rang. The one hour passed by so fast, I didn't even know what happened during that period. And the afternoon, the same thing happened. And that evening, Goenka, who many of you know, who know about Vipassana, who was running the program, who's no more now, he came, comes on a video and he says, some of you may have experienced this. And he talked about compassion. And somebody asked a question here, exercise and compassion, Nita had asked. He said, compassion is the noblest emotion that you can possibly have. And compassion is the only emotion that can conquer pain. And it's possible that if you had experienced serious compassion, you would have been able to conquer pain. My first thought was, how the hell does this guy know what I'm experiencing? How did this happen? Obviously, it is happening to different people at different stages of time. So that was the seventh day. On the eighth day, as I, now I didn't have any problem. I could sit and uh, in the same position, lock myself. And suddenly at a point in time, I felt that I wasn't there. A truck could have passed through me and nothing could have happened to me. It was as if mind and body didn't exist, even though the whole process was about focusing on my body awareness. And that evening, and, and that happened in that afternoon as well. That evening, Goenka comes on the video and says, some of you may have felt that you disappeared. And again, the whole point of it was, I wasn't somebody specially chosen by the universe for that experience to happen, but this process by itself makes that happen. So essentially it's a process in which you start with breath awareness, body awareness, and you transcend the breath and the body awareness into a state where you are beyond the mind and the body. And that is the state that is called in the Mandukya Upanishad as Turiya or the fourth state of awareness. It's not something people can teach you, believe you me. It is something that you can learn, you can practice and you can experience. And those of you who are familiar with Yoga Nidra as a process, this is exactly what Yoga Nidra teaches. If Bihar school of yoga, which is probably the best traditional school for yoga in India and certainly in the world, it's not about hot yoga, cold yoga, nude yoga, and all that kind of nonsense. It's true traditional yoga as practiced, as taught by the Yoga Sutra potentially. They have written what is probably the authoritative book, seminal book on Yoga Nidra, which is about breath awareness, which is about body awareness, and finally settling down in your heart center, the heart chakra, and moving beyond the mind and the body. And it happens in four stages. The first stage is what you might call the mindful state, where at the very least you are aware of what is happening. You are not unaware, like a couch potato. You are not totally oblivious of what is happening around you. You, 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 you become aware of what the present moment is. At the next level, you get into a state which is similar to the rapid eye movement state or the dream state where the body awareness disappears. For instance, you could have a nightmare, a lion attacking you, someone attacking you. You have the emotional trauma, but you don't have the bodily trauma. So essentially, you are in a space 
what the scriptures call as a pranic body or a pranic sharira, where the effect is on, on, on the emotional body rather than on the physical body. At the state, state, third state, where you go into the deep sleep, you are in a state where you have no identity, you don't think, and you have no awareness of the mind and the body. You are technically unconscious. But still your autonomous nervous system works. And transcendental meditation, Maharshi Mageshu's uh, transcendental meditation is basically centered on this particular state of what is called shushupti or deep sleep, which is also in Sanskrit called pragna. It's a strange name for deep sleep. Pragna means awareness actually. At that state, your thoughts are in a seed form and you can with experience, with practice, be able to access those thoughts in that state, in the seed form and be able to change them. In fact, you can reframe them. You can create a new future for yourself. So many of the techniques of visualization, creating future can be done in the deep, so so-called deep sleep state. And that is what yoga nidra helps you to reach. And the final state is one where it doesn't matter to you what happens. You accept, you surrender. That's a state in which you reach the topmost chakra of your mind, which is a sahasrara, which is about complete bliss, complete fulfillment. Whatever happens to you, it doesn't matter really. I accept whatever is happening to me because I believe that is what is good for me. In fact, surprisingly, when I trained in NLP at the master practice level and beyond, again, I, I don't remember the name of the person. She is a very famous uh, NLP practitioner and teacher. It is called the co-transformation, where the teaching is essentially that anything that you experience, however painful, is being experienced because of some value to you. And once you understand what that value to you is, what is the benefit of that pain, the negative trauma is, you will find that it becomes an enabler rather than a disabler. So it's, it's an extraordinarily powerful concept of how you can use the fourth state of awareness, which is a disengagement from the mind and the body to be able to perceive everything that happens to you as something which is very positive. So actually you reach a stage, and this I can attest to because um, it is something I, I find it extremely difficult to be able to visualize something for myself, but I can visualize for a larger good. The rest of it, whatever happens to me, it, it's in a state of acceptance. For instance, I can visualize that, yes, we would surpass Japan, we would surpass Canada, and perhaps even UK in a number of master coaches. And as I was telling one of my uh, cohorts, probably not in my lifetime that I would surpass US, which has got 350 master coaches, but perhaps in their lifetime that would happen. So there's a certain amount of creative visualization that I can do in terms of a larger space, in terms of a meta goal, but not specifically for me. But there's a complete acceptance and fulfillment of the state that I am in. And that is the state of the fourth state of awareness. And to be a coach, and that is the state you need to be, where you're completely non-judgmental. You are in a state of acceptance where it's no longer about you, it's about the other person in what way you can see their grandeur, you can see their potential, how you can take them into that space. And what Otto Shama so beautifully calls the generative listening. And, and this is where I see the congruence between a lot of Western psychological theories and thought leadership with what has been what is being taught, what has been taught in the scriptures, be it Zen, be it Tantra, be it Yoga. So I'll stop here for a minute and take questions. Uh, for seven days, Pallavi says it was jail for me, but gather my courage and complete eight days. Something changed and no pain at all. Absolutely. Every, that is exactly what it is, Pallavi. 
that I can see myself as a third person and that is what is really disengagement. And that is the complete opposite of mindfulness. Mindfulness is about your subjective experiences, your ability to see yourself. And in yoga, the first four Ashtanga yoga, which was what was prescribed by Patanjali, had eight parts, eight limbs. That's why it's called Ashtanga. The first four are called the external yoga, Bahiranga yoga. The next four are called Antaranga yoga. Most of us who practice yoga, or most of the world practices yoga, is the external yoga, which is about postures, about breath control. The internal yoga starts after we have mastered the ability to be aware of our body and our breath. And the first step in that is to move away from the senses. And one of the ways of moving away from the senses is to focus on one sense and to be able to master the ability to so deeply in, engage yourself in it that you can transcend that sense. And then you move into thoughts and you focus on one thought. Dhyana, which is meditation, is not about no thought. Very, very often people tell me, you know, I was in meditation. I didn't, I have no thoughts at all, which is rubbish. Because meditation is about a thought. Focusing on one thought is what is called meditation. As long as you're alive, there is no way that you can be without thought. The very fact that your inhalation follows your exhalation, that you are breathing, is a desire to live. It's a thought to live. So when there are fake masters who talk about sunya meditation, which is about not having any memories, they don't even know what they are talking about. The word that sunya, that Buddha used, was not about not having thoughts, but disengaging from thoughts. It was about the void that you can get into, where you are able to, as Pallavi says here, I'm the third person. I'm not the actor, I'm not the creator, I'm just a witness, I'm just an observer. Okay. Kind of your question, does everyone go through these stages to read the crown chakra? Um, you know, I mean, bhakti yoga doesn't necessarily mean that you reach the sahasrara. Let, let, probably I may disillusion you. Um, uh, I mean, very often people talk about, let's say, the difference between Ramana Maharshi and Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was bhakti yoga and he reached that state and Ramana through jnana yoga, he reached that state. Uh, these are interpretations. They had evolved probably to a state where they were in, in, through the karma that they had acquired and they arrived here in an ability, with an ability to be able to move into that state. Ramakrishna was a mystic. Ramana was more uh, probably different, more, more on the jnana yoga side. Bhakti doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you reach the crown chakra. You, you could be very, very steeped in bhakti and you could be stuck in your third eye, which, is, uh, uh, which can lead into arrogance. E each of those chakras has a positive and a negative. Uh, so I, 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 can, I can go into this in much greater detail. Um, Saranda comes easily. Yeah, it depends on the faith, I guess. If you are following the... Uh, Dvaita philosophy, which is about saranda, yes, the saranda comes, and that's just why many of the known people who are so called bhats are from that tradition. Whereas people who follow the Dvaita tradition, uh, who do not believe in saranda, who, who believe that uh, I'm, I'm God myself, uh, I'm a reflection of God, there's no saranda there. You might call it ego, but it's not. So, so it's, it's a different concept. Um, yeah, but, uh, Nishmita can be also say when we reach the state of disengagement, we are able to build on the skill of looking at things with objectivity. Absolutely, 100%. Yes, and not at the cost of a pushover. Totally right, Nishmita. Yeah. You, you, because you are able to look at things dispassionately, uh, which also gives you the ability to be able to discern where they are being manipulated. Compassionate doesn't mean that you need to be pushed over, that you need to be manipulated. Uh, you can laugh and move away from there. You, you may not want to, 
if you understand, let, let me put it this way. If I'm compassionate, if I do realize that somebody is manipulating me, um, I don't need to pick up a fight with them. I can just look at them saying that, okay, there's something which is going wrong with that person. And uh, that's the reason why that this person is behaving. So there may be better alternative for me than get into a scrap with that person. Let, let me move away. Let me walk on the other side of the road, whatever. Or forgive them. Um, there is actually a absolutely powerful, phenomenally powerful technique, Hawaiian technique called Ho Oponopono, uh, which is all about our taking responsibility for negatives in other people. We uh, look at it from the perspective that someone else is suffering. It is I who is causing that suffering. And therefore, I beg forgiveness of the universe, forgiveness of that person who is suffering. And uh, finally come to the state where I forgive myself, I love myself. That actually is, is a very, very high state of mindlessness, uh, which is practiced by uh, the Hawaiians. So th this is available in different parts of the world. Uh, the shamans and the Native American philosophy, they have been following something like this. The Sufis follow a very high level of surrender. And that surrender is not the same as uh, what we talk about in the Dvaita. That, that surrender the, the dervish, uh, the, uh, the person who goes through the Sufi dance of the dervish, uh, is actually uh, believing himself to be able to reach the state of uh, the divine. Uh, so he becomes uh, equal to the divine. So I, I'm covering multiple things here, and it, it's a huge, huge ocean-like subject. Um, we can talk about it more. But what I would like to do in the next session is to take you through some practical demonstrations in terms of taking through processes where um, simple meditation techniques and, uh, and, and see your own responses. I, I would really like to have far more interaction. Uh, I, I do realize that uh, I pretty much talk 100% of the time, uh, except for answering some questions. Um, can never spell it, but it's excellent, powerful. Yeah, ho, hope. No, it's not hope. No, no. It is ho. Opono pono. H o o p o n o. Opono pono. P o n o. Uh, that's a Hawaiian word. You Google that, and there's a Dr. Hugh Levitt who was talking about it. They say he is not the originator; somebody else is. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Can you talk about empathy from coaching and yogic perspective? Probably in the next session, compassion is possible when one cannot empathize. Does empathy, I'm not so sure. I think empathy and compassion are related. I don't know, again, I mean, that's my personal feeling. Uh, you need to have empathy. Well, compassion is probably a deeper expression of empathy. That, that's what I believe, I may be wrong. Uh, because when you state, <laughs> <laughs> when you start looking at it from the perspective of the fourth level of awareness, uh, you, you, there, there's no question of right and wrong. Everything is right. Thanks for sharing questions. What do you, mental meditation is the same as the concept meditation in Kundalini Yoga. Uh, how long does it take from mindfulness to mindlessness? Normally any technique can be used. What are the exact implications of mindlessness and coaching to be? I'm glad to answer them. So Gloria, if you could, just come in the next class and start with these questions. I, uh, Kundalini yoga meditation is highly formal, highly structured, and also highly dangerous. I had both good and bad experiences. And I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody to suffer the same stuff that I suffered. Uh, it could have been far worse. So if any of you is practicing Tantra, Kundalini yoga, be extremely careful. It's extremely dangerous. Um, mindfulness to mindlessness, the shift is immediate. It, it just like, for example, Pallavi talks about, I, I said, there's a point in time the shift happens. And once you've been through that shift, it stays with you all the time. Uh, mindlessness and coaching is really absence of ego. Uh, I define presence as absence. You are present in a coaching conversation when you are absent in ego. And when you are have the ability to be absent in ego. That means you have overcome your sensory perceptions, your judgmental viewpoints, and therefore you reach the mindless state. I know that I'm probably not being that clear as you want, but unfortunately, uh, 
the, the, these, these are very experiential states. They are not cognitive state that I, I can explain. Can one be in a state, in a mindless state all the time? I guess so. I guess uh, you can stay in the state of mindlessness, but um, maybe there are very few people. I don't, to be honest with you. Um, it comes and goes. And uh, yes, uh, if you look at people like Ramana Maharishi, I guess they were perpetually in the state of mindlessness. And uh, those are one in a billion kind of people. Can Turiya state happen without conscious intent? Yes, I believe so. Uh, uh, like, for example, Ramana Maharishi, the first experience of Turiya happened uh, without conscious intent when he was 16. Uh, so it's possible. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Do you feel mindless coaching is the same thing as transpersonal? Uh, not necessarily, but can be. Um, I mean, if, uh, I, yeah, she's not here. Um, for instance, I, I sit in front of Fiona. I've had sessions with her, both as a coach as well as uh, a supervisor. Yeah, I, I think her ability to transcend that is certainly phenomenal. And uh, probably is, she's in a state where I would call pretty much as mindless. Uh, but it doesn't have to necessarily be. Uh, but I see what you are saying, because transperson is going beyond the mind and the body. You are going beyond uh, those sensory perceptions, and therefore there's a possibility. Uh, I, I need to really look at the semantics of what transpersonal means, uh, because it's such a difficult term and can be used in different ways. But maybe you're right, Ramchandran. Um, thanks, Ram, for those insights. Yeah, okay. So we are there pretty much on top of the hour. Thanks very much. But truly, I mean, uh, next time around, I really would like to have some questions from you. Um, either before that, you can let me have those. And Ramchandran, please don't ask me, what did I talk about last time? I don't, uh, I, at this point in time, I, st I still do perhaps remember. I do have some traces of what we talked about but I'm sure that I would not remember when we meet again next time. Uh, what is the name of the true traditional yoga? The name of the true traditional uh, yoga nidra is probably what I mentioned. It is uh, nidra means sleep, the yogic sleep. It's part of uh, one of the high level uh, meditations. Mindless is there's no memory to some extent. Yes. It means no sensory perception. There is no judgment. Um, you are, completely disengaged. You are a witness. You are an observer. Okay. Um, coaching presence by Maria. Thanks, Michael. I'll, I'll certainly take a look at it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Good night. Thanks, Jackie. Bye.